We're missing a key element, which is uh, John Roderick. <laughs> Do we really not know where John <laughs> And may I add, are we surprised at that fact? <laughs> He's taking us down from the inside. You call me the villain. What'd you do with Roger, Paul? I, I, I can neither confirm nor deny I know the location of John Ryder. I have to tell you, this is, I know what's happening. This is payback. There is a, there is a moment uh, on, the, on our trip to Africa. Me and David Reese and John Roderick were there performing for the troops. We were playing at this base in the like, rec center on the stage for a bunch of uh, scary military people who want to punch nerds in the glasses. <laughs> and uh, John was going last. David started with some pencil sharpening. I played some songs about monkeys and robots. John Roderick did some sensitive, sad songs. And then we had agreed to close with Toto's Africa. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> And uh, we had been doing that on the shows, and David and I uh, stepped outside for a moment to have a beer. And uh, we were sort of listening to John Roderick, John Roderick's performance in the bathroom. Uh, in the bathroom? <laughs> in the background, I meant to say. It's certainly a much more interesting story if we're in the bathroom. Uh, and because I don't, I, I don't like to do that. You know, I don't, I don't like to step away from a... This is good. <laughs> I don't like to step away from a fellow performer when he's on stage. I like to I like to be there to support him, but I was not there to support him. And in fact, it went quiet for a little bit too long. And then I realized what was happening is he had finished his set and he had said, and he had said I'd like to bring David Reese and Jonathan Colton to the stage. And we were not there. And I don't know for how long. I honestly don't know for how long. Because when we finally panicked and walked inside, he was like, oh, here they are. So, this is, this is payback, and uh, I congratulate him on a job well done. <laughs> oh, look, it's the, it's the phone guy. I literally can't hear anything you're saying. I would like to point out, I thought I saw John Roderick cheekily wave at me from the back of the room like he's trying to nail us, when in fact, he's just eaten to his, into his own performance time. So you sure showed us, John Roderick. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is an act that deserves no introduction. <laughs> Uh, thank you, nerds. Wow, thanks, man. How you doing? It's nice to see you. Uh, obviously, Jonathan and Paul do not know how to start a show. <laughs> In the rock and roll world, you start a show with the star at the back of the room, and then he runs to the front. Runs? Or, in this case, I'm wearing flip-flops, so I would, fl I would flap to the stage. But they, you know, they needed, they needed their hands held, they needed to see me, they needed to feel me. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're in the crew state of mind, not the yeah, rock and roll state of mind. That's right. No one here is in the rock and roll state of mind but me. Look at that little guy. This, uh, this is our podcast, Roderick on the Line. It's called Roderick on the Line because I am the titular star, but really the star of the show and the star of the internet, my internet, is my friend Merlin Mann. We're going to try and translate this podcast, the, the podcast experience, to this live environment. Uh, and, um, and we're going to be, like we normally record the show, uh, constantly being shuddered by bow waves. Uh, but they're virtual bow waves, and now we have real bow waves to shudder our show. Just a reminder, some topics bring a rogue wave. And we'll just avoid some of those things. Are we going to talk about our Kickstarter today? You know, one of the problems that we've had with our podcast is we have not really successfully monetized it until no. just recently. We, uh, you, might have, you might have heard some of the buzz yeah. about our uh, 
new uh, new project. So Exploring Kittens has kickstarted now, I think, probably conservatively, what, five million? That was like yesterday. Yeah, five yeah, million. Yesterday. Yesterday. We just recently put out a Robert on the Line t-shirt and have sold 700 of them. Yeah, so. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. so that's why we're going to last on this program. <laughs> We, uh, how much time we got left? Because each t-shirt was ten thousand dollars. That's the amazing thing. <laughs> uh, so uh, normally we begin the show uh, with Merlin calling me on the phone. Yeah. Uh, and uh, me having. Just We've been having conversations up. for years. Yeah. John used to sleep in my house, whether I liked it or not. He'd bring a band, and we would end up eating uh, a very, very large uh, amount of dim sum and talking about a lot of unsolvable problems in the world. And so we agreed that's something that others should have to hear too. <laughs> and now John's helped a lot of people along the way. But one of the funny things is when we first started doing the program, it was still culturally agreed that uh, middle-aged men, uh, middle-aged white guys, still had all the answers to the to world's problems. Yeah. yeah and true. then as we progressed through the show, uh, the world has changed, and now no one wants to hear no. what forty-six-year-old uh, uh, dudes think. Uh, and then it hasn't stopped us. No, no. We still have all the answers. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that we can help people with. Uh, I don't want to be too on the nose. Are, are, are any of you familiar with a concept uh, that John and I pioneered? It's called keep moving and get out of the way. Thank you. In a, in a nut, the basic idea is there's a lot of people in the world who know they need to keep moving. Some people know they need to get out of the way. But I need everybody to know how important it is to keep moving and, and get out of the way at all times. That's right. It's a revolutionary thought technology. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, never, never is it more apparent uh, how desperately this is needed, this thought technology, uh, than in the Windjammer Cafe. The Windjammer is not... <laughs> You see some of the worst symptoms, the anti-patterns of the keep moving and get out of the way problem. Which is, of course, who's the, who's the biggest problem in keep moving and get out of the way? The person who thinks as long as they keep moving, they don't have to get out of the way. Right. Wrong! Keep moving and get out of the way. And so you get this. You get somebody who's suddenly very attracted by white rice. They, 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 they kind of come over here, and then there's kind of just a moment where they're kind of leaning toward white rice a little bit, and they see a little bit of gravy they're over here. They're in movement, here. you notice. They're, they're, still they're, approaching, they're approaching the sauce, the sauce and stew station, <laughs> just intoxicated with all of that, yeah. and, and it, the entire line stops. Well, this is the, so the wind jammer will point out how, how important the two components are, because you can, also, you can also fool yourself that you are out of the way in the wind jammer, right? You can get in there, and you're like, oh, I don't want to be in anybody's way. I'm going to get out of the way. Yeah. But then you realize there is no out of the way in the wind jammer. <laughs> if you are in the wind jammer, you are in the way. <laughs> Which is why you need to keep moving and get out of the way. Yeah, and now nobody can do either. And, and you're hungry. People are mad. And it's, it's, a, it's a terrible situation. And I, I, I don't know if there's anything, because the thing is, I don't want to be ego-assertive. I don't want to be normative. Mm -hmm. I don't want to bring too much of my own personal mores to the jammer, as mm -hmm. I like to call it. I don't understand the words you're using, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> You know me, I like, a, I like a food with a lot of sauce. I, I saw you, can I jump in? I saw you eat the shit out of some sauce today. I like sauce. There was, not a cu there was not a cubic millimeter of white showing on this plate. Hmm. First time that's happened in John's life. <laughs> There's no whiteness at all. It was on pure wall-to-wall -wall sauces, stews, and various steamed vegetables, and it was and it was it was like a penumbra. Is that what you call it? It looked like it might have been a meniscus. It was something scientific. It had a lot of sauces. See, the thing is, this is one of the primary differences between me and my dad. My dad was born in 1921, yeah. and uh, those, are, those are no sauce years. Yeah, and he did not he did not like sauce uh, because he believed that sauce was a way that you camouflage poorer cuts of meat and leftovers. And so he wanted his meat and his veg his vegetable. They have to be discrete piles. And I always wanted sauce. My dad would be like, hey, they're putting the, they're putting the bad mushrooms in there. <laughs> That's how they get you. Yeah. Oh, they got a lot of extra mushrooms. They put it in the sauce. <laughs> I miss him. But I, but, but I love sauce. So you're, I'm, in the, I'm, in the, uh, I'm in the stew uh, portion of the Windjammer Cafe getting all the stews, right? Because nothing is better uh, to do with two stews than to make a third stew. <laughs> right, you're gonna think that the stroganoff and the curry don't belong together, but of course they do. Unless there's the Derrida. That's right. And I'm in the stew line and I realize that not only are there people who think the line begins up here, 
coming toward me Christ, on the stew line. So we are like, we are basically a stroganoff and a curry on a collision course with one another. But then there are the people who think that their method of, of getting it, uh, keeping out of the way oh, is oh, that they... Oh, 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 yeah, this is, you get, uh, I just want to get one item guy. Yeah, right. Right, and, and so also kind of one structural thing, uh, they, they should put these starches near where the plates are, because you get a plate, you put the starch on it, and then you, excuse me, and then you move into the proper saucing and stewing area. They didn't do that in this case. They got the mashed potatoes. Thank you! Am I right? I love this country! I don't like what's happening to this country. Which country is this right now? The water country? Do you, here's the thing. God damn it! You got mashed potatoes right here. So far, so good. <laughs> Luxury cruise, I'm gonna add some mashed potatoes. Fuck you. Right here, you got a brown gravy. Wait a minute, who's this over here? This is the stew. Yeah, see, exactly. The stew. And, and then, then the rice. Rice over here. I, mean, like, I wouldn't have even gotten mashed potatoes if I knew there was rice halfway up the line. I didn't hear stories about my family dying face down in Europe to have rice come after the fucking stew. <laughs> Absolutely right. So now you got Johnny one item, he's gonna be that little squirrely guy who does the zip in and zip out. He's trying to zip in. He's trying to zip in and zip out. You know, because he wants rice with his hamburger. Oh, I love rice. Here's the problem. For five years I've been coming on this cruise. And, uh, and uh, for four of those years, John Hodgman and I have sat at a table somewhere in the Windjammer Cafe talking about all the things that need to change. <laughs> And all the, all the ways that Jonathan Cole needs to understand that we have a better idea how to run this trip. He's going to really make it go, this thing, you guys got notes. That's right. Yeah. Uh, what has happened is that Hodgman finally uh, destroyed himself and is now sitting in a cardboard refrigerator box called jo uh, uh, Hodgman's Cruise. Uh, <laughs> waving a flag. <laughs> And, that is all. And I'm up here having uh, having experienced complete surrender. I'm now wearing uh, shorts and flip flops in the theater. <laughs> I, uh, I, I understand now that I do not know how to run a cruise. Yeah. I'm only here uh, to watch Jonathan run a cruise, and uh, and I wish that I were learning something. There's nothing to learn. But I can't. I cannot learn. Okay, we talked about this. We've learned. Here's how you run a cruise. If you're Jonathan and you've got this incredible staff of people and the amazing scene monkeys who visit, John has Jonathan has distilled the art of managing a giant project down to one physical gesture. John, have we worked this out ahead of time? Yeah. Yeah. Have, no, we no, no, we have not worked out this. Uh, thing Please there. define in one physical gesture how to run a giant a giant shitstorm of activity that you have very little control over. Here's here's how Jonathan does it. <laughs> and then sometimes, <laughs> and the cruise keeps happening, <laughs> and everything gets bigger and better. And of course, if I were running the cruise, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> there, there would, would be, be a similar, similar gesture. Foghorn, leghorn. There would be a similar gesture. It would just be like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we're not going to play your tape. No, you can't put your towel there. No, you can't have a hat on. Take off those pants. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you're wearing flip-flops on a goddamn cruise? What's wrong with you? Are you an animal? <laughs> you know, I gotta say, we uh, don't actually have a Kickstarter. We, we make zero money. But we could have a John Roderick cruise take all the things that you've learned, all the ways that you could help people, and literally put it on a boat. Well, the thing is that a John Roderick cruise would happen on a train. Uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and because a train is a, is a linear thing, there's no circulating. You just keep trying to get up to the front, and your passage keeps being blocked. And you, you're, you hear there's ports, but you've never met anyone who's ever actually been to a port. <laughs> it's just a long, long ride on a single rail, and it never stops. Yeah. And God, you wish it would stop. Yeah. And I think, it, I think it actually happens in Canada, too, so there's nothing to see. It might be Canada. They don't know. We've taken away their phones. They have, they have no phones. Yeah, everybody's taking the pledge now, because guess what? You have no personal belongings anymore. Welcome to the cruise. <laughs> It's a cruise, we call it a cruise, right? We say it right on the sign, it's a cruise. Yeah, you've heard of a thing called Winnipeg, but you've never seen it and you never will. It's just it's somewhere in the distance. Yeah, thank God, is that right? Except for the person from Edmonton. Sorry. And here's the thing. I, I, I told you this, I, I've learned three things about taking vacations, right? The first thing is almost everything, with all due respect, 
for one thing, almost everything that's in the brochure, or what passes for the brochure, is at least 75% mm, kind of bullshit. Like, you know, hey, it's going to be the cup, it's going to be the cupcake uh, cupboard. And we go there, and it's a store where they have cupcakes. It's not really that joyful, but it's fine. Rule number one, a lot of what they say is maybe not 100% true. Rule number two... Well, wait a minute, with the exception of yes. tan Tanzanite. Which is an incredible investment grade gem, and if you guys <laughs> if you miss the opportunity to get in on Tanzanite now, I haven't heard tell me about Tanzanite. You're gonna you're gonna go back to your hometowns, and your friends are gonna be here on the ship. Tanzanite by the foot, but also in St. Kitts and St. Martin. Yeah, it's available. It's Come talk to me after the show. <laughs> Number two, it takes some time to just wander around and figure out what is actually good. And number three, focus heavily on doing one to three things that is actually really fun, that is good for that environment. Like, you know, maybe uh, you're not going to find the things that are exactly the way you like it at home, but you will find something you like. Here's the thing, though. It's a cruise and it doesn't matter. You can't leave. <laughs> so I hope that advice is useful, but no one cares. If you're on John's cruise... <laughs> It takes four sets of dick quotes. On John's Cruise, John's Cruise is a train that no one's allowed to get off of. We take your stuff. There are no ports. There will be Tanzanite available. Uh, and in the Super Bowl that plays on my uh, train cruise, the Seahawks will win every year. And it's always Taco Tuesday. <laughs> Whatever you say, John, because that's what it says on all the shirts. That we have. Whatever you say, John, it's your train. It has been a terrible adjustment for me realizing that I was not going to be capable of changing the way everyone in the world thought. Uh, uh, and, uh, right? And the, and the, it's been hard for us, too. And the great, yeah, right, I know. It's hard for everybody to be halfway through their reprogramming and be like, what, you're stopping? Uh, but really, I had a child uh, uh, a few years ago, and now she's four years old, and I realized that I am, I've been completely unsuccessful in uh, teaching her anything. She already knows everything. And, uh, if I can't do my own four-year-old that I, that I have in a specifically designed dog crate, <laughs> with, with the iPads playing me talking all the time, what hope do I have of, of, uh, of changing uh, this outside world of people in fezes with monkeys on them? No chance. It's nice to think you've hit rock bottom, but you probably haven't. There's always lower to fall, and that's a consolation. I'm going to walk off this stage and tell Jonathan something that he should do differently. Yeah, what would you? I, I can't help it. You got any tips? You know what I would say? I would suggest he try and get the talent to the stage on time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, like because of free will, right? Right. Sure. Sure. Uh, that's the second Rush reference in the show. Do you remember? Is anybody keeping track? Go ahead. No, I'm good. I'm good. I just, the thing is, I, uh, I realize I am broken. Uh, I'm never going to actually be able to help people. I've lost my will to almost anything. And yet when I see something as fucking simple as putting the starches next to each other, wow. it just galls me. Because I realize I don't, really, I don't really care about fixing the world's problems. I, sure, I care. Uh, I care tons. But like, I'm never going to fix that. I'm never going to go somewhere and say, oh, no one's allowed to have water from bottles anymore. Eh, everybody should get eye surgery. Who fucking cares? But I could certainly get some gloves and some tongs and get the starches into one fucking place and it would make everybody's life easier. <laughs> Come on, how hard is that? But here's the problem. They, oh, so yesterday, basically from the time I got on the boat, that was the day before, from the time I got on the boat, uh, I was just basically counting down the seconds until they opened the sprinkles up by the pool. Uh, but as soon as, I, as, soon as uh, the first cruise that we did where they had uh, on-demand frozen yogurt uh, all the time, yes. which is, I guess, uh, it's also a way of saying on-demand, uh, I, I basically just time my days between what I feel are uh, appropriate uh, lengths of time between Sprinkles visits. It's like, it's like if, if for the sake of argument, somebody super creepy was watching and really wanted to find out how often you got Sprinkles, well, is there a pattern they could pick up? No, I'm going to take a different route every time. You're not going to be able to, no. you're not going to be able to, like, you would have to camp out by the Sprinkles Dive into a lifeboat. And be prepared to, to see me through my disguises, but I keep... <laughs> I'm no, mine. I definitely was not here 30 minutes ago. <laughs> Sprinkles? Is that the place by the pool? That sounds delicious. <laughs> if I had Sprinkles three hours ago, I, I might go get it again, but I, but you know... Small, you make a small one, right? Well, so here's the problem. I, I've been waiting for the Sprinkles. The Sprinkles machine opened. I, I waited a decorous amount of time. I didn't push any kids out of the way. <laughs> 
But I walk up to the sprinkles machine, and I'm a guy who likes to give advice about how to live. Uh, and, I, uh, and there are two sides to the sprinkles machine. I, this is a life hack. Uh, everybody lines up on one side uh, because they're ding and they just go to the bright light and they see. But you can go around the other side and there's like no line. The sprinkles machine you can spend as much time with as you want. And I put it under and I'm ready to get the, du the double swirl, right? Chocolate and vanilla, which is the only kind of sprinkles this world to get. This double swirl, because you get both times. It's a little bit of a curry stroganoff situation. And I begin to make my first sprinkles cone of the cruise. And, uh, and it goes like this. And I have made like a completely, uh, I've made a, first of all, like a mathematical, like an unstable mathematical uh, structure that immediately begins to, to degrade and decay. And, 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 I'm, and I'm under there and I can't, I, I, like... It's not the traditional circle. I, I, I did not manage to start the swirl, so now I'm making, yeah, a, I'm making a rhombus. And, <laughs> But I'm also, I'm, I'm also fully committed to it, right? I'm not gonna stop now. So I put another rhomboid on top of the original one. And pretty soon this, uh, this ice cream cone is like, it, it's uh, the, the width of a shoebox. But it's made out of like 14 different interlocking pyramids. And then I'm done, and I have to walk across the deck with dignity. <laughs> Well, it, it, did weigh, it did weigh a pound, it was structurally unstable, and it looked like some kind of, like, secret uh, radio telescope. <laughs> and so I had to, you know, then walk, and then I was like, how do, where, where is the escape route out of here? And there is none, you have to go just right through the main, uh, you know, waterworks park. And so then I got, I got on the elevator, and I'm the guy on the elevator with the... With the... A melting uh, rhombi? Uh, well, yeah, like an East German ice cream cone. <laughs> For this, my family saved eight seasons. <laughs> and, I, yeah, and as I'm standing there on the elevator, and people are like, Captain. <laughs> Mr. Roderick. And I'm like, hello, hello, I meant to do this. <laughs> this is on purpose. This is an ice cream cone you haven't thought of yet. <laughs> and I realized, like, I'm in no position to give anyone advice. <laughs> You can't, you can't put it down. You can't shake hands. Right now, you can't even melting, really shift it from one hand. Don't tell all the way up my elbow. And so I just went in my room and like shamefully ate this thing. And then took a shower. You are living the, literally the independence of the seas. That's a lot of independence, John. Yeah. It was humiliating, and I, you know, I, I just had. Uh, I just had a, a fairly serious life event uh, for, for the entire uh, time of Merlin's and my show. Part of uh, my persona is that I keep an impenetrable castle at home. That, uh, that you don't know. No. I basically have. Are you, are you doing this? I basically, yeah, I basically have you know tiger pits around the around the uh, around the house, and I, I have a an umbrella stand by the front door, except it's full of swords. <laughs> and in every way, I keep uh, I keep my my house uh, secure. And right before the cruise, the day before the cruise, my home was burgled while I was in it. I was asleep upstairs, and they came in and they stole uh, all my stuff in the middle of the night. They came in through the one window that I thought I that I thought I didn't need to double secure because it faced the street. It came in through the front window, and while I was in the house, they. They burbled it, and and so my entire shtick, which is that I am a uh, I am a fortress, like I am a fortress, uh, now uh, has been dispelled. So I lay in bed, and uh, normally at night, as I'm laying in bed and thinking about thinking deep thoughts, I think of all the ways that I would, if I if I were in a bank and some bank robbers came in, I think of all the ways that I would dispatch them with the pens from the. <laughs> <laughs> and then there'd be bank robbers, you know, like, they wouldn't die, I would just hit them in a pressure point with a thrown ballpoint, sure. and they would go to sleep. Uh, and now I can't even indulge in any of my, like, hero fantasies because I uh, was robbed under my own nose. 
Could you tell the soft serve story again? <laughs> This is the this is the this is the thing. I am finally at, at, just at the age when I begin to also contemplate death with every step I take. <laughs> I'm also increasingly aware of all uh, that, uh, that none of my theories work. So what, what what's next for us, Merlin? Yeah, I know. We before the show we we talked about having headset microphones so that Merlin could do a little bit of crowd work. And I bet he's wishing he had that now. Could I ask you guys one question? <laughs> Who's ready to get rich? <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> oh, and the sucky part is you were asleep. It happened in your house while you were asleep. Well, here's the worst part. Are you ready? Oh, God. I heard them. I heard them. And yet, there's been a possum living in the walls of my house. <laughs> For the last month. In cahoots with the cat. And I lay in bed and I heard this noise downstairs and I was like, that fucking possum. Uh, is, he must have brought a friend. Like, maybe they're mating in the walls. And I'm about to go on this cruise and I've got possums fucking in the walls. That, that won't do. And so I was like, I just have to go back to sleep. I don't want to think about the, I cannot solve this possum problem in the next 12 hours. So I'm just gonna roll back over and go to sleep and ignore the. You problem. found a rare dose of fucking sanity in the midst of madness. You said, you know what? I'm not gonna be a crazy person who thinks there are, uh, you know, uh, possums in the walls that are gonna have sex while he's on a cruise. I'm not gonna think about that. Yeah. I'm gonna go back to sleep like a gentleman. How'd it yeah. go? I could have gotten up and pounded on the walls and said, "Fucking possums!" <laughs> <laughs> I've done that six nights in a row, prior. <laughs> you picked the wrong night to stop being crazy. And it had no effect. <laughs> I did. I picked the wrong night. I was like, okay, you know what? I surrender, possums. You are you are God's creatures. Come live in my warm house with me. And in fact, it was not possums. It was uh, people downstairs rifling through my boxes of Hubert Humphrey for president pins and taking all the you know taking all the Humphrey ones because maybe they were worth more money. Yeah, that, they were really they were choosing thieves. They picked they picked only the good stuff. They left all the Nixon memorabilia. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, no, no, it's tough. It's yeah. tough. I'm really churning on it. You, you, you uh, want to open it up to questions? <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> uh, so they left the sword umbrella rack. They didn't take the swords. They took I think, I think they probably picked each sword out and laughed. <laughs> put, just picked it out and was like, <laughs> <laughs> Zoom some lords. <laughs> uh, uh, so they took expensive stuff, so the big question. Yeah. Question that must be asked now that you fucking brought it up. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. That's fine. Uh, it, do you think it was an outside job? Or do you think it was a pseudo inside job? You understand my question. I do, and this is the This thing. is the first thing that occurred to me. Do, could it be a slightly inside job? Well, I, I, I ran through uh, my life. Uh, you know, in a sort as of you do every night. Yeah, as a sort of fast <laughs> flash. And I realized that I had reached that perfect moment in my life where I no longer have any crackhead friends. <laughs> right, even five years ago, I would have been like, yeah, there's three or four guys that probably could have been. But yeah. I don't know anybody that knows where I live that w is also capable of stealing my stuff. You don't think it was an ardent fan burglar? Oh, the possibility of it being someone who listens to the podcast and is also a burglar. <laughs> uh, fan's the wrong word. Enthusiast hmm. or potential heist puller. <laughs> Who just happens to listen to podcasts where people talk a little too much about their life, hmm. and you can glean information about the sorts of things. Are the Braille Playboys okay? Hmm, no. Well, you know what? I didn't even look for the Braille oh, Playboys. Jesus. I, I've always said that the best combination of the best combination of like life components would be to be uh, like a meth addict and a locksmith. <laughs> Right, because he would just be in this perfect circle of like, now I practice locksmithery, now I smoke crank, now I practice locksmithery. It's like a fighter magic user with meth. Is that an actual wave? Is Sorry, that, yeah, that's a wave no, when I that happens. A duck. Uh, so, uh, you know what? I, it's entirely possible that there is a fan and that maybe robbed me just to teach me a lesson. Right? Oh. Because it might be a rival podcast. I, a rival podcast? <laughs> it could have could, could been Jesse Thorne. <laughs> <laughs> a rival. Looking for a, uh, for a new straw. I'll let Jesse know when he's a rival. <laughs> <laughs> the 
sorry about that, John. I was only kidding. The, the worst part about it, of course, was that all the stuff that got stolen, I don't care about. They took my passport. Oh. Oh. Which I'd spent 10 years meticulously filling with stamps. And I was the guy that would, and David Reese will attest to this, I was the guy that would go through customs and uh, hand my passport to the guy, and he'd be flipping through, and I would say, um, sir, Actually, I know exactly where I want that stamp. Oh, man. Right here. It's like, the, it's like a photo album. Yeah, and so the passport, the passport had only two months till it expired, and I should have put it upstairs in the file of retired passports that I keep. <laughs> But I kept it down. Don't you have like other people's expired passports too? I do. I have a, okay. I have a collection of other people's expired passports, and this was going to be this was going to add to it. And, but I was keeping it down on the dining room table because I like to look at it while oh. I ate lunch. And I would flip through and I'd be like, oh, mm, yes, and that's the one from Cancun in 2002. <laughs> and they took it just because I, you know I'm now I'm convinced that maybe it was somebody who listened to the podcast because I, I believe that God is trying to teach me an inscrutable lesson about vanity that I cannot I cannot uh, parse. I and he can only he or she can only do that through people who listen to podcasts. That's right. God's because God God's holy enforcers. God is speaking to people. Through John, podcasts. you literally talked about this on the last released episode of our program. Before. I do. Yes. I talked about John is John's not familiar with our work. <laughs> <laughs> we did a live performance in San Francisco where we talked about passports. Oh, passports. And then... Yeah. yeah. Uh... Jeez, ah, I don't even know where to go with this. Would you like to, uh, would you like to take some uh, questions from the audience? I want to know what you're going to do, what you're going to change. Will you seek vengeance? Will you refortify your borders? Will you... Uh, will you what are you going to do differently? Woo. you gotta be, you got to be mad. He shouldn't, you know what? <laughs> I admit it, it was me. I get it. Hypothetically, <laughs> John, if you were going to change things about your security, what would that be? <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure you pick a good password. Tell me. <laughs> Ooh, that's good. I'm beginning to feel like the answer is to surrender. Uh, and not, not in a bad way, but to, sur to, to like, to, to just dive off the back of the boat and just float looking up at the stars until you are eaten by a whale shark. Which doesn't eat... I know, I know. And so, uh, whale sharks are well to a mythical creature. Uh, Swallowed by a whale shark, and it's spit out, but too late, I'm already gummed dead. Gummed by a nurse shark. Gummed by a whale shark. Ah, uh, that's a great guy to mention. Joking on krill. Two, three, four. Would you like to take some? Uh, we got, a, we got. Actually, we got a butt ton of time. Oh well, then we can still talk about our Kickstarter. Yeah. We can still talk about our emotional <laughs> Kickstarter. Uh, John, man, that's. Uh, I hate that feeling. Let's yeah. see. Uh, that's the, the uh, just the invasion. Feeling. But this is the thing. I feel like I feel like we've said it many times before, and and things don't happen for a reason. A lot of the time, and there's no there's no way to. Um, there's no. There isn't a lesson to learn here. Like I did. Yeah. I did what I could, and then uh, bad things happened. And it isn't a punishment for me. I didn't do anything wrong. It doesn't. I didn't earn it, and I can't be. I can't be sad about it in, in it's, a way. It's, it's not a lesson. It's a test. It, it, the, the lesson is to go. Well, it just goes to show you there's always something to learn. It's like no, that's not true. It's a test. It's a test of the universe going. What kind of crazy bananas non-lesson? Will you draw out of this completely random event that now makes you officially a crazy person? And then there's a credo over time, and now you're officially nuts. And what, what, you know, I had that moment where I was like, do I not go on the cruise? I would, totally wouldn't have gone on the cruise. I can't well, believe you did this. Because I had to then spend the last day that I should have spent picking out, you know, matching bow ties with pants, which is what I normally do the day before the cruise. I had to spend that time getting a new passport. And I don't know if anyone here has gotten a passport in a day. Yeah. yeah. But it's a fantastic experience. You really learn so much about America. <laughs> and about the ways in which people that do the same job every day do not feel like today is a special day. <laughs> the people in the passport office do not think that my problem is a special problem. Right. right. It's the same old problem. Oh, it's... I mean, I, I've, I used to have a kind of... Uh, I think about people who do things like, in, in my experience, uh, rental car, check-in, people who work at the desk at the hotel, 
uh, people who work at the DMV, people who work for the State Department doing passports, whatever. It's like, <coughs> they've never worked with anybody who was happy to be working with them. They've never worked with anybody who's like, oh God, I hope this takes five minutes longer than I expected. Like, <laughs> your entire experience with that person is gauged by how little time you are in their life. And I, I don't think I could do that. I don't think I could stand being somewhere where they were like, mm -hmm, yeah, great day, fine day, great flight, thank you, that was very relaxing, could I please have my goddamn room? You know? <laughs> and that lady, like, she's never had anything but other people's emergencies, and it's her fault all day long. And, and the thing is, I'm sitting there, and it's like, the, okay, the doors close at 1, it's 12.45, and at that moment, the, the guy I'm dealing with decided that he needs to replace all the paper clips. <laughs> in his paperclip thing before we can go any further. And it's just like, and I had to be in that moment with him too. And I was like, I do see that your paperclips are the thing we need to do right now. <laughs> because I am not gonna be the person ineffectually yelling at the passport office guy. Because I know that it's only gonna slow it down. So I was just like, uh, the, the, the decision to go on the Joko cruise now is being made for me by a chain of bureaucrats and each one of them has to decide at a certain point that they want to do the, the, the next thing. And it happened that entire day. I was like, I was at a DMV, I was at the passport office, I was at the Federal Express place, and every step of the way, people at the very last minute were like, oh, and the last paper clip is in the box, and here, stamp your thing and go to the next window. And, like, and uh, so I go. So I float along like a jellyfish in, a, in an ovoid bowl. <laughs> just waiting for the rocks. Just waiting for the rocks. And somehow I just kept like, you know, I was abrading on the rocks each time. but I Not, never, not quite destroyed. But I never disintegrated. And then I got on an airplane and, uh, and had one of two lifetime airplane panic attacks. What? Where I was sitting on the back Jesus of the airplane. Jesus Christ, John. Right? And I'm ready to, they were ready to take off, and I was like, wait a minute, this plane is going to crash. I don't want to be on this plane. I want off this plane now. And they were like, we're next in line for takeoff. And then I had to say, I am not the person that stops this plane. <laughs> it's, it's, just, just, it's just not who I am. And so then the plane like turned on the runway, and I was like, then the panic attack didn't stop. I was like, I really, 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 really want off this plane right now. And I was like, I will go to my fiery death rather than go down in history as the guy that turned this plane around. <laughs> and then the plane took off, and I was like, now I'm going to play threes for five hours. <laughs> And the plane didn't go down, so again, I was wrong. My intuition was wrong. Or right. It's hard to know. Tough week. Yeah. So, but here I am. I made it on the Joko Cruise, and I feel like everything, uh, all the, you know, the chain of events. Yeah, that's an appropriately half-hearted right applause. <laughs> Is he, is he saying it did happen for a reason, or it didn't happen for a reason? Like, like, I'm just glad John's okay, but I'm not sure which side I should be agreeing with. Because it? it seems like it happened for a reason, but not really for a reason. Is this a funny podcast? Is this a funny it's show? Funny. <laughs> it's kind of weird. What, what, what category is this podcast in? I don't think they're on some philosophy podcast. Well, I thought they just made fun of people. As a matter of fact, it is a philosophy podcast. It is a philosophy and podcast. And all the time I get, it, it's in the philosophy department of the, uh, of the uh, iTunes. And I get emails. <laughs> I love the first half of that sentence. It is in the philosophy uh, department of the iTunes. <laughs> I do get emails from people who consider themselves philosophers. <laughs> it costs nothing to consider yourself a philosopher. <laughs> Actual, like, university grade philosophers. Who are like, uh, I, I, I believe that you were making a Hegelian uh, inference in the last podcast. And I'm like, stop. Stop right there. Do not interpret this through a philosophy way. Have some Heraclitian stream. <laughs> That's not funny. No. Those Greeks aren't funny. That's normative. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what you call it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just traveling to me is a very anxious, anxiety-producing thing. You seem like you've gotten really good at it. You've got ways to do things. I I, I didn't know. So you said it's your second panic attack you've had on a plane. So one time I was on the back of a Lufthansa mega jet, one of those jets that has like six seats and then a small aisle 
and then 40 seats <laughs> in a small aisle, and then six seats, and then like three more adjunct seats. <laughs> and I was on the back of, uh, I was sitting in the very back of the plane, because I used to think that the back of the plane was the best place to be. Uh, because that was the... You have more time to think about your death. Well, the survivability <laughs> rates were better. And my uncle, in 1947, my uncle was on a DC-3 uh, taking off from Seattle of Yale football players. They were flying back to New Haven on a DC-3. And the plane uh, suffered a malfunction on the ground, caught on fire. And my uncle was sitting in the back. And he popped open the door that he was sitting next to and jumped out. And everyone else died. <laughs> And so he tells this story, not very much, but every once in a while he'll, he'll, he'll be like, oh, and then there was the, the, you know, he calls it the fire or whatever. And it was like an entire airplane burned up on the ground. And he just got out the side door. And so I always sat in the back next to the side door. But uh, one time I was on this Lufthansa jet flying to Germany and the, uh, the girl sitting next to me had decided that this flight, this like 11-hour uh, flight, was going to be the one where she kicked drugs. Oh. And so, sitting next to her, and she's like, you know, just sweating, pale, and like, you know, like, really, really tripping, tripping out. Um, and I had, I never had a panic attack before of any kind, as far as I knew. And I suddenly was like, I cannot be here anymore. I cannot be on this plane anymore. And but I, there was nothing I could do. And so I paced around hyperventilating for a while. Okay. And, and imagine all these scenarios. And again, I was like, I am a 35-year-old man. I do not have panic attacks on planes. And then I was, and then it was clear that that, that what I had just said was false. <laughs> so you jumped out the door. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I went back to the galley and tried to talk to the stewardesses like we used to do in the 70s. Uh, and but modern uh, uh, flight attendants are unreceptive to that. They used to be way more open to nervous talking. Yeah, they did. They were just like... Oh, I'm, I'm a nervous talker on the plane sometimes, and, and I, I don't think they're as into it as they used to be. No, I think they were like, can I get you a water? Could you... Yeah, she said, rejoin your seat, sir. And I was like, Chill. Well, all right. And, uh, and so... Rejoin your seat, sir. So I, so, you know, I shuddered my way through that flight. Uh, and got a contact tie off of my seatmate. Yeah. <laughs> but then I thought that that was a one-time only thing, and I thought it was situational, and then now it's, now it's happened twice, so now, ooh, who knows? Now the floor's shaking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to buy seven packs of gum before every flight, and just send like, more gum, more gum, more gum. But yeah, I feel like I know all about traveling. I feel like I'm like a professional traveler. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, and with every step, uh, with every successive year, right, they, they, are making traveling more and more onerous to prepare us for the uh, the transport barges that are going to take us to the moon colonies. <laughs> uh, and so, as we get more and more used to this kind of like, oh no, I'm sorry, there's no right. there's no more food on the plane, and uh, you can buy a deli box for fourteen ninety five, but you're going to get uh, silverware that breaks. As soon as you try years, this is going to be pure human caterpillar to the stars. And then they're going to be like, who wants to, who wants to be on one There's mission to Mars? There's not going to be an in-flight magazine. Yeah. There, will not, there will not be a movie. Yeah. It's just going to be a lot of you sitting very, very still and trying not to breathe too much. Yeah, it's just, it's all prep. Yeah. So that when they, when they finally are like, yes, okay, there are UFOs. Yes, they have been controlling the government for a long time. Don't panic. Boarding begins now here. Boarding your seat. <laughs> now, now, now boarding our star all our members. <laughs> oh, our members. members, active members of the military. Thank you for your service. Yeah, so I'm 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 prepped. <laughs> They're gonna go to sleep for 15 years and then wake up on the planet oh, God. Captain, Captain. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just hoping when that moment comes that they recognize me as an officer. Yeah. <laughs> There's probably going to be a lot of need for uh, self-organization. You know, you're going to need somebody who's willing to make, make the tough decisions on the colony. Yeah, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Someone that has a natural sort of command personality. Yeah. But increasingly, I'm realizing that I, uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just, uh, I'll just be mucking sluice boxes like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I would, I would be, I would be probably making sandwiches on day one and made into sandwiches on day two. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the last, last of the sandwich, uh, the scales on the plaque, the kinds of plaque. Just, just, a, just a brief survey. How many people here are currently eating soylent? Well, that's, that's, that's a few. That's right. More yeah, than, that's more than forty. So, yeah. 
And then they're, I like these. These are good. This is like, yeah, I mix, I mix my son with chocolate milk. So technically not. <laughs> you and your you parfaits. Yeah. <laughs> your gluten-free parfaits. <laughs> I, I, I do drink 14 beers a day, but the rest it's soy. <laughs> Uh, you know, everybody likes to think they're green, and they like to recycle, and I hey, put my bottles by the curb, I get a ribbon! But they're not really fully committed to recycling on the level of skin flakes. And that's where we really need to be looking. <laughs> you know, in a mission to Mars, you're going to be harvesting those skin flakes, because that's like... Oh, at, at the very least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got, you got the guy who had the dune suit, you're going to have to suck out the various liquids, that's going to go into some kind of a sluice. And then what are they mining, do you think? Are they mining to build more places for mining? Is it a make-work project, a space make-work project? They're probably mining oxygen, right? That's the first thing they're going to mine. They're going to gonna be working in the oxygen mines. What was it? Oh, Tanzania. Oh, Tanzania. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You're in that one. The thing, about, the thing about Tanzania is it's only available in a few uh, Caribbean <laughs> islands, but it's plentiful out in the solar system. Okay, side. I'll go. I'll bite. What is tanzanite? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a precious metal, only available for people on cruises. You want to start accruing that like you would those Krugerrands you can buy from TV. My experience of tanzanite is that it is mica with some gold foil Elmer's glue to the back. <laughs> maybe, it sounds quite handsome. Maybe I had that wrong. Maybe it really is a precious metal. Yeah. Uh, or maybe it's, maybe it's a tree bark. What is it? A stone. A stone. I, I, oh, do you know it's not a soap? Have you ever done a field kit right here? here. Right to <laughs> rub it on That's yourself? not tanzanite, Mon. <laughs> it's actually a deodorant. It's casual. <laughs> uh, I think it would say Tom's of Maine. Tom's of Maine bars. It would be unobtainium, right? That's what they would That's right. Unobtainium is the impossible to, to get. The nerdamantium. Or uh, whatever it is, whatever it is in Guardians of the Galaxy that they were taking out of that space God, school. Here we go. Here right? What was it? John's comics and sci-fi corner. <laughs> it's uh, it's like uh, space brains or something. Uh, you mean the uh, the various crystals, the Thanos uh, crystals you're talking about? No, no, no. The uh, the big floating skull oh, mining sure. collar. You got the uh, nowhere. Like eyeball yeah. juice of yeah. uh, space yeah. beauty. And you you celestial. You get the celestial, like, a little bit ping pong, <laughs> but you get the celestial juice out of the uh, the dead god, right? That's what they're doing, right? That's right. Celestial so juice out of the dead god. Right. So that, 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 that was great. My voice was on that. That was great. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, would you go on a man mission to Mars? No, no man mission to Mars. No, no, and uh, you're. You, you mentioned your, your your friend David Reese was asking this question. When this was was it, so when we were on a tour in Africa, David Reese asked every uh, service person that we met, uh, "Would you go on a one-way man mission to Mars?" And what was astonishing was, uniformly, the answer was absolutely. And it was, when we were amazed by it for a long time until we realized, well, yeah, right, these guys are all in the army. Of course, they they're ready to go at any time. Just clarify the conditions, though. It's a one-way trip. When we trip to Mars. Definitely when you're going you're gonna to go to Mars, whatever happens on Mars, you're definitely going to die on Mars. Right. You're kind of going to be a martyr, isn't that kind of implied? Settler. The original, Settler. You're going to be, uh, you're gonna be but the... But you get the glory of being like the people who set up Mars. Yeah, you're going to be the, the Brigham Young of Mars. <laughs> <laughs> who wouldn't want to be the Brigham Young of Mars? That was, uh, yeah, that was Edgar Rice Burroughs, I believe. Right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I felt like... I felt oh, that's like, kind of funny, isn't it? A little bit, no? Yeah. Right. Okay, by applause, Fine. how many of you would go on a one-way man mission to Mars? Wow. Uh, now, by applause, how many would not go on a one-way man mission? You know what? The second, that's the guys with the bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sure it's still good. <laughs> so, but but there there is there is quite a group, but it is still a minority yeah. of people. More than I would have thought, though. Yeah. Well, but this is a uh, te uh, technophiliac group of people, right? They want to be on the cutting edge, yeah. the bleeding edge, and also the manned missions of Mars would need some IT people. That's true. Right? They That's need true. to keep the servers up. But I think we should also do a little bit of just quick vetting. Uh, that probably we could do based upon, maybe do show of hands based on anything that's happened on the cruise. Has anybody at any point ever felt the need to maybe complain about anything on the cruise? I mean, I have. Sure, sure. Okay, you don't get to go to Mars. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're not really worried about whether the rice is next to the stew. You're going to be eating skin flakes and not that much of it. Okay, now how many of you are prepared uh, to learn that this is a one-way mission to Mars? <laughs>
We, 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 we just found the leaders. We, we spent uh, eight days uh, processing salt water into fuel, and then on the last day... <laughs> we're gonna die in this can together, guys. <laughs> but we're gonna take the stew with us. <laughs> and our fearless leader, whenever confronted with a problem, just goes... <laughs> There's lots of troubles in there. Listen, I would settle Mars with you people. I would. Oh, that's a good group. And there are a lot, you know, there are a lot of uh, Joko cruisers who pair up, who are paired off with one another. Uh huh. So a lot of breeding pairs here. <laughs> <laughs> I really saw that anyway. Um, which puts yeah, me in kind of an awkward yeah. position. Because yeah. yeah. you're gonna have to break up relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Like you're at the high school dance and you're just gonna give somebody a tap. It's <laughs> time for daddy to waltz. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, like Frank, oh. Frank, Sinatra, Frank Sinatra with Nancy Reagan, just like. Oh, dance. Ch chair on the board. <laughs> Reagan just keeps turning, he's confused. Who tapped me? <laughs> <laughs> he was president, he's all oh, cussed. Gosh, I'm just not gonna talk anymore. We should take some uh, questions. Would you like to ask? Would, would anybody like to ask questions to John? There is a Maybe? there is a microphone over here, here uh, on the on the stage. Uh, if you stage want, left. you could uh, demand satisfaction. You could seek redress. I mean, I, I know that you have done this question and answer thing before, audience, because I've seen you do it. You line up over there, and then five people ask questions, and fifteen people are disappointed and sad. <laughs> um, we'll keep talking until somebody, uh, yeah. until somebody. Merlin, something. do you know what you, your role would be in a, in a Martian colony? Uh, yeah, I think I do. I think I do. It would be partly that I would be there to try and keep the other panicky people calm and probably not doing very well. Mm -hmm. uh, they would give me some kind of a job that was ultimately really meaningful, uh, meaningless, but kept me busy. Right. I think. I think so you'd be filling out forms. You'd be the chief yeah. form filler out. Yeah, exactly. I'd be the guy moving the paper clips around. Okay, now we have a line for questions. Perfect. Uh, my question is actually for Merlin. Hi, of course. Hi. I'm a big uh, You Look Nice Tech fan. Thank you very much. That's a good program. <laughs> I was all four of you. Thank you very much. It's up to Adam. He wants to put the last episode out. Call Adam. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I was a two-part question. I was wondering if later I could possibly, for a few seconds, do the fish stick with you. I would love to do the fish stick with you. <laughs> Maybe we can have a group fish stick. Anybody who wants to come around? Just... Yeah. Is, is this a mating ritual that I have? <laughs> I really doubt it. What, what happens, what happens if you get I don't the think fish anybody stick? has ever got laid from a fish stick. <laughs> and I was wondering if you guys were going to reunite it. I, you know, you never know. It, it could happen. Uh, you know, Adam, so it's a podcast uh, that I used to do with Scott Simpson and Adam Lissagor, only sandwich. And Adam's really, 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 really rich now because uh, he does all these commercials and he's doing uh, really well. And Scott and I do a comedy thing in San Francisco once a month. I would love to do it. I will, uh, no, I, I appreciate you asking and I'm going to tell Adam that's one more vote. Yes. He's being a car to suck. Thank you very much. Please. Say hi after, please. Okay, okay. Hi. Um, I love both of your work, and I love Robert Online, so I gave a podcast. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> and I was just wondering, especially for people who maybe don't listen to Robert Online, if you guys could talk a bit more about, a couple of weeks ago, you got into a bit of a conversation on the show about the idea of boxes and putting people into them, and the more boxes someone seems to fit into, eventually you just sort of write them off as weird. And go about your breath. Does that make any sense? Does it that make makes sense? a lot okay. of sense to me. I think I've experienced that on both sides, and I think everyone here probably has as well. Yeah, and so, if have. you could maybe just talk a little more about that or reiterate in a, in a, a clearer way than I just did, sort of what that idea was and, and how you maybe deal with it or how you've learned to deal with to, to train yourself not to do that so much to other people. That's a great <laughs> question. Do yeah. you want to reiterate? Yeah, I just, I just I had this thought that like it, it feels like. I, I don't know if this is peculiar to like an internet age, it's probably always been this way, but it strikes me that uh, you're, when we think about other people, there's these algorithms, heuristics, what do you want to call it, there's these little things we go through, there's this little pachinko game, we're trying to figure out who somebody is, and they basically get to have one primary like value on an axis, and then maybe one other thing, where you're like, oh, that's the cute girl who plays games. Oh, that's the black guy who's great at sports. That's the that's the Asian guy who's really good at volleyball or whatever. And you're allowed to have like one primary axis, which is who you are according to how you looked at everybody. And then you get one of, kind of like this. 
And it's my theory, it's a one-bit thing, though, pretty much. You've got a one, you're going to mostly fit, 80% of your personality has to fit into this one-bit description. And then I think if you get too much going on where you go like, oh, that's, that's, that, uh, that's that person who used to be in marching band, but then really got into knitting, and they're thinking about joining the army, and pretty soon you're just weird. Because now you don't really fit into the one bit plus an access box. And I find it extremely difficult, and I find it frustrating, because uh, I do it with other people, and I think people do it with me, and it drives me bananas, and I try really hard uh, to get around it. And one of my ways I do that, if we visit, and I hope we will visit, I've been trying really hard to make friends at this thing, but I think I'm too outgoing and it's freaking people out. <laughs> Please come say hi to me. Like, yeah, but like, seriously, like, don't hit me. Um, but I would like to visit with people. But like I always say, like, do anybody know? Like, what's my question? Like, what are you excited about right now? That's what I want to know. I don't care how much fucking money you make. Like, I don't care, like, any of that stuff. What interests me is like, oh my god, what are you incredibly excited about right now? And to me, that's where we get out of the box a little bit. God, that was accidentally inspirational. I'm well, really sorry. <laughs> I think, I think it's, I think it's true. Yeah. We, we do it to ourselves, and, and one of the things that I, that I love about the Joko Cruise is that, that, that it is possible to imagine that each of us in our individual lives back at home uh, get thought of, uh, or a lot of sea monkeys are like, oh, he's the IT guy, or she's the science uh, girl that, wear, that has weird hair. And then you get on, you get all together here, and you realize here is where the, you know, the our multifacetedness is appreciated because here there's, with baked into this culture is the is the capacity to see that uh, see like all these different permutations of these ideas. There's a lot more shades, shades of gray to that. It's it's almost like the story David Sedaris tells about when he first went to college, and he David Sedaris talks about having been like the the dark goth guy at his high school. He was the goth guy. And then when he got to college, there was dozens and dozens of dark goth guys, and they were all better at it than he was. And you're like, mm. You know, but you get to come here and you get to see a little more gradation to that. And I think it not only helps you figure out other people, it helps you figure out yourself a little bit. Well, you know, in my high school, I was a, I was a nerd uh, because I read the Wall Street Journal. I looked like some, right? Right. And, and, uh, and then, uh, but later on, uh, when I talked about myself as a nerd, other kids that went to my high school were like, you weren't a nerd. Right. You were... I've had the experience the, being told I'm being a nerd wrong. Yeah, you were one of the cool kids. And yeah. it's just like, right, I, 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 you know, like we were all carrying around a, a, a big stack of boxes up in our own minds. Oh, that, that, was that was the, nothing. That, that was, was the ice skating rink. Thanks for coming. All right, thank you. Let's get rich. Is that a GoPro camera on here? I'm just happy to see me. Well done. <laughs> I wanted to say sorry about hearing about your house being broken. It's quite all right. Um, my question is, have you thought of pitching that to a story to Liam Neeson for taking four retrieval of <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I want you to listen. My name is John Roderick. I have a very special combination of skills. I do feel like I will I'm... find you. I will get my shit back. And I will kill you. It's a great idea, but I don't know if Liam could really be energized to get my Sonos back. Like, I'm gonna get that Sonos back. Like, it's just do you know this... how long it took me to configure that? This, 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 I had to enter the Wi Fi password three times. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. You are also my favorite podcast. Oh, thank you. And a second vote for You Look Nice Today. Oh. Makeups, which thank you, thank you, thank you. Which is somewhere down the list of your favorite podcast. Somewhere <laughs> between two and five. Well, it's way down because it hasn't been on for four, oh, five years. Right, right. Oh, but I've been thinking. listening to it. Thank you so much. I liked. It's really you don't. You're not, you're not supposed to like what you do. You're not. You're supposed to sandbag and go. Oh, really? That's really nothing. I fucking love that show. I really like it's doing awesome. that, and I miss it now that it's. Gone. Do you notice her t-shirt? Her t-shirt is. Whoa! No way! She has a. My key. husband made this for me for Christmas. That's it beautiful. says, "Keep moving and get out of the way." <laughs> John, I want you to get this thing. That looks well, really before good. Before your t-shirt came out. So. That's, so, that one's kind of nicer. That's, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> My question is, uh, a few podcasts ago, you two had a lot to say about uh, men and hat etiquette. Right. You had a lot of strong opinions, which yes. were really helpful for me. 
But I also wondered, what about female hat etiquette? Female hat etiquette has always been a completely different animal. Well, I know, but you didn't say anything about it, so I didn't know if you would land anywhere. If you were I don't know that much. Of, I, I don't know that much about it. So this is a thing that I've learned having a daughter, which is that uh, uh, people mess with her hair all the time. And she's always complaining about having her hair messed with. And no one ever messes with my hair. And so I never complain about it. So in the, lo in the logic of, uh, of me-centered universe, complaining about your hair is like, hair what is that about? But uh, last night, I was up on at the, uh, the Fez party, and someone said, would you like a tiara? And I said, absolutely, I would. And so I put the tiara on and immediately commenced spending the rest of the Fez party trying to keep the fucking tiara in my hand. <laughs> and every person that I stopped to talk to spent the first 15 uh, minutes of our conversation fucking with the tiara. <laughs> and pins were put in, and my hair was back combed, and then the tiara was stuck on there. And I realized that, uh, that the torture of keeping a hat, uh, of, a, of a lady hat, on, involves so much uh, superstructure, it's like, a, it's like they take apart an Eiffel Tower and stick it into a hat, and then, and I think bras are the same way. I'm wearing one now, but it's a sports bra. And so I believe that the etiquette surrounding lady hats is, uh, is much more complicated because they are... There's a lot more to taking it off. I mean, the, all I know of uh, back in the day, you're a lady, you get your hair done, you wear a hat, you put a pin in, right. and you don't touch that stuff all day right. long. Particularly if the hat has bananas in it. <laughs> right. uh, you're not going to be able to just doff it every day. Well, you'd have to replace them. You take one up and one back. That's, that's just etiquette. So it's, a, so it's a situation where I think the etiquette rules are different, and also I don't. Uh, I don't live in a world where my hat is nailed to my head. <laughs> so but I but it, it's generally more accepted, is it not? That it's okay for women to have hats on in more situations? Is that still the situation? Right. Absolutely okay. it is, yeah. 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 Although, if you are a woman wearing a fedora, the rule, the, you have to doff it. Right. It's all about ethics and fedora journalism. Yeah, do not... <laughs> Uh, actually, unless, uh, uh, unless you pinned the fedora to your head, in which case then you should put a little card. But instead of saying press, it should say pinned. <laughs> and everybody will know. Uh, hello. Yes, sir. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm awesome. I have two things to say. One's a comment. I'm glad you didn't abandon your drink just to come up here. <laughs> oh, you think you're better than me? I, I made of hot dogs and ranch dressing, apparently. <laughs> So, first to comment, I am very disappointed that Hodgman and uh, Scott Simpson aren't on here because it'd be a Game Changers reunion. Mm. And that was an amazing uh, show. Um, thank you. That was a thing we did in, uh, in, we did Seattle. in Seattle. It was a one-time only, uh, completely like, you. scripted variety show that... Uh, was John Hodgman kind of took over. It was, a, it was either a three-wheeled three car or a four-wheeled bicycle. <laughs> Uh, but it was very fun. So yeah, ne maybe well, next year. Four, four steering wheels and one tire. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. I have the poster on my wall, and I actually know the guy who picked up your guy. You dropped a D6, and you were so irate that I had to sign it. Oh, well, take good care of it. You got a resin Yeah, exactly. Those are actually his droppings. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's true. He made it. Cool. He knows he walks I say, honey, I gotta go make a saving throw. <laughs> It's not funny, it's not funny, Coop's not funny. <laughs> That's so, not funny. My second comment, uh, it's a question for both of you, and it's the same question I asked uh, Mr. Rothfuss uh, in October. If you could have a voice in your head, in addition to the ones that are there, <laughs> that you could turn off at will, and it could be any person, real or fictional, that gave you advice and talked to you, who would it be? Wow. Because I realize it's super nervous. I mean, obviously John, probably, for me. Because I know I'd like to be able to turn it off. Right. <laughs> I'm going to say uh, Sean Connery. Because like, I would take it all with a grain of salt. It would be pretty funny. He would think it's serious. I would not. Which would make it even funnier. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You should get the rice before you put the stew on. <laughs> Move that little girl out of the way. She's the problem. <laughs> Uh, I feel Shut like, up, Sean. <laughs> I feel like the voice of Bismarck is so loud in my head that no other historical figure would be able to shout him down. <laughs> yeah, I love on Bismarck. He, he is still so mad about the Prussian, the Prussian advance. <laughs> 
that, uh, the way it's all day long. Is, ooh. Really nothing else, nothing else. There's no room in there for anything else. That's a big Except voice. Every once in a while, my dad goes, "You're fucking up." <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, we got time for one uh, more question. Hello. Yes. I don't have anything near me so smart, uh, but with keep moving and stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear uh, what you have to say about what should happen to the most despised people on the planet, those who drive too slowly in the left-hand lane. Oh, uh, thank you very much. John, is there, is there any chance, is there any chance that you might have a thought on that, John? I feel like, I feel like every aspect of that person I just manifest out of my imaginary world, right? I mean, I, I'm just like... There is someone who represents the person that's asking me about people who drive too slow in the fast lane. And it looks like that. It looks and sounds like that giant. Does you mean like like when you walk with wolves with the peyote? That's the person who would appear. Like that's your spirit guide. You've been waiting for that particular very cool looking person to show up and go. Do you have any thoughts on people who drive slow in the fast lane? And now you're out there. You're fucking David Crosby walking with wolves in the desert, right? That's right. That's right. I'm I'm on fire and I'm going to be buried in the Joshua tree. And I have one last thought. Let me just give you one quick answer. I do feel that we are very, very close now to robot cars. And that this problem is about to be solved once and for all. Uh, and when the robot cars come, then the only people self-piloting their cars will be people driving Camaros in the desert. And that feels right. But in the meantime, it's, it is a, it's an adjunct of keep moving and get out of the way, which is that uh, you need to keep moving and get out of the way relative to other people who are also... It's uh, in inertial relativity. It's inertial relativity. All, relative to other people who are also moving and getting out of the way. So, and you see this in the Windjammer, this problem where two people are moving. They both feel like, yes, they are satisfying the moving criteria. They are also getting, they're satisfying the getting out of the way criteria. But in fact, they are moving in enough synchronization that they are not moving or getting out of the way. They are... You have their pack now. Yeah, yeah they, have become, they have become a slee stack. <laughs> is, is, that a, is that a plural collective? A slee stack of buffet, buffeters? Yeah, yeah, right. They're a slee stack of wind Wherever jammers. two or more of them are gathered in his name. If two or more people at a buffet are not getting out of the fucking way, that's called a slee stack. That's called a slee stack. And if you get four or five slee stacks... Right. Then you're gonna go over a waterfall at some point in the episode. Right? Okay. Uh, so yeah, this is the problem. You have to always. This is the this is the peripheral vision problem, right? You always have to have in your periphery yep. everybody that everybody whose way you are in. I hate to end the sentence in a, with preposition, but that is just how that went. Um, yes. Assume this is the thing. When every time I walk out of the door of my cabin on this ship, I immediately assume I'm in someone's way. Oh, absolutely. Even if the hallway is clear in both directions, I feel this like is, it's just. This is, this is what people don't understand, John. This is what's so frustrating about it. Is yes, it is self-involved because I need to get places. But it's so it's so much about a, a bigger thing. It's about a worldview. It's about me getting the hell out of your way too. It really is. It's yeah. about like if I'm not if I'm not moving, I'm not getting out of the way. I'm, I'm no matter what. I, you're always in the way. So get out of the way. As people totally. in America, particularly on the hungry. roads... I know you're, you're hungry, but don't make a sleaze stack. Right. Don't make a sleaze stack. <laughs> uh, particularly on the roads in America, there is this uh, like uh, mistaken belief that, that driving etiquette is regional, and that people in Michigan and people in Tennessee have different uh, rules about how to drive on the roads. But that, in fact, is wrong. We are the United States of America. <laughs> and this is not an instance where states' rights apply. <laughs> if you are in the left lane, and there is someone behind you, you are the problem. If you are, if you are in the left lane, the people behind you should be receding into the cave. Right? And if there's anyone who is coming, any, if you see anyone who is red you're like, colored you're like a, instead of green colored. It's automotive midwifery. It's part of it. It's your job to help the baby get out. Like, get out. You have to shepherd it along. It's not enough to just go, guess I better move. You need to be really constantly thinking about that. You're part of Hukakuna Matata. You're part of the giant wave. Make because, it happen. That's right, because if don't get out of the way into someone else's way. No. Right? No. If you are getting out of the way, you need to be, you need to have seen where, the, you need to see the way. Then what's the, the best way. way to get out of the way? Keep moving. So really, 
really, we could even take a word out. Keep moving out of the way. <laughs> uh, with that, right? It's, it's word economy. Get that hand out of the word. Keep moving out of the way. Keep out of the way. Keep out of the way. Keep out of the way. Can work for you? Good, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. That's, that's the kind of... Uh, Will and I are going to have... Uh, oh, yeah. We're going to do another show uh, with John Scalzi. And Opus, is this official? Yeah. There's a very serious thing that's going to happen tomorrow afternoon. It's going to be a nerd bullshit off. And it's going to be John and Opus versus this John and me. And I think it's going to be pretty epic. It's, it's going to be in the labyrinth at 4 o'clock. Is that correct? Four o'clock? Yeah. So uh, if you want, come to the labyrinth at four o'clock. It's going to be a combination uh, nerd bullshit off and office hours. Yep, and then we'll do office hours after that. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. John Robert and the Brown Band, everybody. Keep moving and get out of the theater. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>